this cannot be the way the story ends. I need a massive rebrand. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I'll do. I'll write a book and get a movie made. <laughs> what else is there? Freaking genius. Like, I was 35 years old, millions of dollars in debt. Yeah. A convicted felon, a social pariah. What do you do? Mm. What do you do when you don't like the way the story's been told? Mm -hmm. You figure out a way to tell it differently, right? Mm -hmm. From your words. I sat in my house for a couple days. You know, I didn't go outside because it was very obvious that I had been assaulted. Um, and I got the New York Times, and I kept waiting for their call. And I had no idea what I was going to say to them. Mm -hmm. For the first time in my life, I had no idea. Um, and then I got the New York Times. And on the cover, it said, 125 arrested in the biggest mob-related takedown in New York City history. <laughs> and I never heard from them again. <laughs> well, that's about where my luck ran out. Yeah, so that wasn't rock bottom, right? Mm -mm. Yeah, that was that was sort of a huge violation, right, that happened. And then all of a sudden... You would have thought that that would have been rock bottom, right? Yeah. <laughs> we got a Well, you're like, I got to fill the safe back up <laughs> yeah. before I quit. <laughs> I'm like, they took all that money. I mean, those photos, you know, I got to replace those Yeah, I kept, I kept running games. And uh, then a couple months later, I got a text message from one of my poker dealers at one of my games. And it just said, the FBI is here looking for you. And in that moment, New York City, standing on the street, looking at that phone, I knew this is over. Mm-hmm. And even though I wasn't really speaking to my dad that much because he was writing me handwritten letters every year telling me that this was going to end badly. And I was so mad at him because, like, I wanted him to know what I had done, mm. that I'd created this whole business, that I had done it completely by myself, that I knew how to manage um, some of the most difficult people in the world. And I'd figured out how to make six million dollars a year and I was savvy and a problem solver and and he didn't see it like that at all mm -hmm. and that made me even more mad at him mm -hmm. you know yeah it but, drove even deeper emptiness yeah by this time my mom and dad were divorced and um so I just you know I, I, I my plan was to go to my mom's house mm -hmm. And I got in a car, tried to buy a plane ticket to JF or to Denver, and my credit card got declined. And then my next card got declined, and then I used my bank card, and that was declined. And I logged into my account, and my account balance was negative nine million nine hundred. Yeah, they seized everything. Didn't everything. They? Yeah, they shut everything down. So I got home, and you know, just the the legal point here is that you're property unlike your personhood doesn't have the presumption of innocence and what had happened is the government had put a confidential informant in the games and towards the end of my career I started doing something that put me in direct violation of the federal statute I knew exactly what it was because I had attorneys that had analyzed these federal statutes and given me this sort of playbook for operating um I would, had gotten sloppy. My debt sheet was big. I was putting people in games that uh, if they won, great. If they lost, you know, not great. Um, and so I started taking a rake, which was, you know, a problem. Mm -hmm. it, it was a violation. And um, they said, you know, the Fed said, we have on good authority that she's been making her money illegally. And if she wants to come in and talk to us about what she knows about the world that she's been living in and all the people, which would have essentially been a, a confession, mm -hmm. then we can talk. And the last thing my lawyer said to them was, are you investigating her? Do you want her to come in? And they said, not at the moment. If we want her to come in, we'll call you. Okay. So, man, I just went away. 
I moved in with my mom. I didn't have any money. I didn't even have a bank account that worked. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was years before I could open another bank account. Um, and I laid in bed and felt sorry for myself. And then my mom came in and said, finally, like after two weeks, she raised the blinds and she said, you need to go out and get some fresh air. You're from Colorado, right? Mm -hmm. All moms, but especially Colorado moms, think fresh air is the, the fix. It's the savior. Yeah. Um, but my mom lives up at like 8,000 feet. Yeah. And I walked outside and it was one of those beautiful bluebird days. Mm. And there were those mountains. And I was raised on those mountains. You know? And I was raised that when you fall down, you get back up. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how, what that was going to look like. Nobody wanted to take my call. My network was decimated. The tabloids were telling the story because celebrities were involved. And of course, they were painting me as some like floozy in the corner mm -hmm. serving drinks. Um, and there's nothing wrong with serving drinks. I was a waitress for many, many years. Mm -hmm. But, you know. Yeah, you were a curator. Yeah, and you know what I mean. You were you were had a business. You I were had, a banker. <laughs> yeah, I was a banker. I was a psych. I was a therapist. Yeah. Um. I, you know, I, I had twenty employees. I. It was. And I had no recourse for collecting, so right. I, I had to, and no protection from anyone. Um. People were trying to cheat in my games and and you know people were trying to uh intimidate me not to have games and there was always problems and i just i could just like solve them mm -hmm. you know anyway so i started walking i started hiking i started spending time in nature i started meditating which i think is the most profound performance tool for work and for well-being mm. because it really is the it's the gym for what we were talking about mm -hmm. for for being able to observe the mind and be completely intentional about where you want it to go mm. that is when true power starts if you can have if you can have a mind that's you know, that is filled with negativity and filled with hurt and filled with doubt and filled with uh, depression. And, and you can start to intentionally shift out of that and re-narrate or dismiss um, or focus on, you know, optimism or hope. If you start to have yield that power, I just don't think there's anyone that can stop you. And so it came to me that I had to do a couple of things. First of all, I got sober because it was just too easy to reach for those crutches. Good for you. Time, you know, that's awesome. And I learned a lot in a 12 step program. Um, I, I call it one of the best educations of my life. And uh, I'm, I d ultimately, I didn't stay in the rooms, but man, those those five or six years that I did during the hardest point of my life mm -hmm. were so critical. And so, um, number one, I had to accept that the situation that I was in was a hundred percent my fault. I had near perfect information on the loss, mm -hmm. all the opportunities in the world. And I'd figured out a loophole to do this thing legally. Um, and I made the decision to take a rake. And so, man, that, you know, that's a couple of days of sitting with that. And it's just, you're, you want to fight it and resist it because it's so much easier to blame other people and blame society. And, the, and But I just, you know, I just sat with it. And, and then I go, and then I had this realization, if everything's my fault, then everything's my opportunity as well. You know, mm -hmm. the world can't do things to me. Yeah. Um, I mean, it can, but it can't, it doesn't have the final say. Yeah. And then the second thing I had to do was even harder and something that I don't think people do enough. I had to forgive myself. Be accountable. I went around. Sometimes I, 
you know, flew places, even though I had to sell clothes and jewelry. I said sorry to the people I needed to say sorry to. Look at you working the steps. I did work the steps. I worked the hell out of the steps. That's awesome. I had not needed to. Mm -hmm. Um, But then forgive yourself. Yeah. Um, Because there is going to be no comeback lugging around that shame and guilt and and also like not forgiving yourself, being in self-pity is kind of selfish. It's like doing selfish things and then feeling sorry for yourself, yeah, you yeah. know? It's a weird cycle. It's a weird cycle. And and so, you know, just in the same way that I had learned to work on my mind before, I worked and I worked and I worked and found some compassion for myself. And then finally I got a job. And it was in LA and it was in this really small, I moved into this really small uh, one bedroom studio. And I thought, okay, this is a fresh start. You know, I feel grateful. And then seven days later, in the middle of the night, I got arrested by 17 FBI agents. They could barely fit in my one-bedroom studio. They had machine guns and high-beam flashlights. And they put me, like, in my pajamas and handcuffs And they put this piece of paper in front of me that said the United States of America versus Molly Bloom. I hadn't run a poker game in two years. I was living like a Girl Scout. I just didn't understand the legal system. I didn't understand that they were taking those two years to build this case. And so I get put in jail. And I have a day and a half to get to New York City to find an attorney that's going to represent me in the fight of my life. The press release said I was looking at something like 30 years. Um, I had eight meetings with attorneys. I didn't have a dollar. Mm -hmm. My mom put up her house to bail me out of jail. And my dad, he was so mad at me for getting arrested by the feds. He said, "Um, get a public defender. And that was was what he said to me. And so... um, What was his rationale? He was mad. He felt like he had warned me all those years and he didn't feel like he wanted to shell over hundreds of thousands of dollars to to, um, to finance what he had told me was going to happen. Anyway, so I hung up on him. (laughs) My mom and I went to New York City. And I had eight meetings that day. Seven out of eight of them said, it's going to be $250,000 just as a retainer, you know, just for the next week or so. And then my eighth meeting was with this guy, Jim Walden. And Jim Walden is one of the really good ones. He had a great reputation with the government. He was a former federal prosecutor in the Eastern District. He would only bring forth these really serious indictments. He went after the five crime families, a very serious guy. This fluff, like, girl running a poker game was not his style. Yeah. And he looked at the indictment, and he looked at my mom's face, and he said, I'm going to help you because you need help. Mm. And my mom and I were just like, yes. And, you know, we had security the next day because most of the people in the indictment were people I'd never met before but were very serious uh, Russian criminals. I don't know how they made the connection. I guess there was a couple of degrees of separation between sports books, sports betting and and poker. Anyway, um, and after the arraignment, I walked into Jim's office and I said, okay, what's our strategy going to be in our angle? Because I don't have any money. And he said, our strategy is going to be integrity. And I just remember feeling like I just someone like punched me in the gut because it it was just like all right there like I wanted to be Jim Walden you know I wanted to have impact on this world like I wanted to be somebody who had moral courage and integrity and here I was under federal public indictment embarrassing my family and you know being dubbed like the poker princess and the madam of poker. And and 
I made a promise to myself that day that no matter what, no matter what was on the other side of the decision, I would never abandon myself again. Mm -hmm. I would never relink. I would never choose the shiny thing for my integrity, mm -hmm. for the for uh, the well being of others. Mm -hmm. And that's really living in your values. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's alignment, right? You're not, you're not going to trade in your values for something else. You either are or you aren't who you mm -hmm. say you are. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I had stopped being that. Anyway, <laughs> the world has a funny sense of humor because mm -hmm. literally a couple of days later, um, the prosecutors wanted a meeting and, they were very excited to meet me, particularly this lead prosecutor. This is the Southern District. It's a very flashy office, very ambitious office. This is where Giuliani came out of. Mm -hmm. um, and the name of the game is to be the lead on, you know, big, flashy mm -hmm. indictment. And he said, don't worry, we're not going to make you unsafe. We're not worried about the uh, Italians or Russians, which is who they should have been worried about. Mm -hmm. But I think that they, you know, had other uh, agencies dealing with them. And, they, and he said, I, I want to know about the, the hedge fund um, owners. And I want to know about the politicians. And I want to know about the checks you wrote and the checks that they wrote to you and from which accounts and... I want to know any inside information you have and, um, and, you know, maybe you might, we might ask you to wear a wire and, and, you know, ask them some questions. And he said, if you're willing to do this and it's the right thing to do, then we'll give you all your money back and we'll give you a deferred prosecution. Oh my goodness. Which will keep you out of jail. I would still have a record, but I could stay out of jail. I had. There's a trade for money again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the earth school, you know? Um, and I went home and I got to the same place that I'd gotten to two years ago. Mm -hmm. This was entirely my fault. Um, I didn't believe or have knowledge that anyone was doing anything in my games that was really harming society mm -hmm. uh were they booking some bets maybe wasn't that going to become legal in new york and new jersey in the next year <laughs> you know like did they write like a dollar over on their political contribution i mean uh, let's just say i didn't have any epsteins or weinsteins in my mm -hmm. game okay and i also could see the intentions with this lead prosecutor i didn't get for one second that he cared about justice, mm -hmm. you know. He cared about himself and a New York Post, flashy indictment. That's what I thought. And that's what Jim thought too. And so um, I went back to the office and I said, I appreciate the offer, but you know, we're gonna turn it down. And then I waited to get sentenced. And uh, about two weeks before I was gonna be sentenced, cause we, we all thought I was going to prison. Mm -hmm. And um, my dad called me and he said, you're my firstborn and you're my only girl and you're about to be sentenced in federal court and we're going to have this, con you know, we're going to hash it out. And it didn't happen in Central Park. I wasn't losing my mind and trading a Chanel glove for an ice skate, which was what was in the movie. Cause, mm -hmm. you know, um, but he did come and, and we spent two days talking and I had always been afraid to ask him this question that I thought I knew the answer to, but hearing it from him would just destroy me. And the, the question was, why do you love my brothers more than you love me? Is it because they're boys? Is it because they've just made you look really good, made you really proud? And I finally just got up the guts to ask him because F it, I thought I was going to prison. <laughs> and he got really emotional and he said, I don't love them more than I love you at all. 
sometimes I like them better. I was a holy terror. My dad was a kind of a dictator and I was a freedom fighter mm -hmm. 24-7. So. Sounds <laughs> epic. So I was grounded a lot. Um, but he said, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I think I might have messed up or, or taken it too far, but I think the world's a really hard place and I think it's harder for girls and I just really wanted to make you tough. And in that moment, all the missing information that we fill in mm -hmm. and create these stories and live with these stories and these stories can can drive us and drive our decisions all the way to the end, right? Without actually ever knowing the truth, mm -hmm. um, fell away. It doesn't mean that I completely recused him, of, but I saw him mm -hmm. as this young man who is a psychologist and wanted me to be formidable. And from that moment, we were able to build this incredible relationship. Um, I talk to him every day. Mm. I have the relationship with him now that I always wanted. And I think I might be the favorite kid now. Mm. Because I got well Costner to play him in a movie. Yeah, there you go. Legacy, you know? Mm. <laughs> and those and you know, like so after sentencing, the, the great news is, is or so I went to sentencing and I got a a judge that was uh, pretty disappointed with my life choices. Mm -hmm. But he said, I see a lot of people have shown up for you today. I, I have great respect for your attorney. You, you seem like in the last year you've worked on yourself. Yeah. So I'm not going to put you in jail. And. You lose your you lose your legs a little bit with that. You know, you can be tough, 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 but like, whew, I didn't want to go to jail. Yeah. And so, you know, I always I always say in my speeches, the good news is is I didn't have to go to jail. The bad news is I had to go to dinner with my family. And here is Jordan and Jeremy. Jeremy at sixteen <laughs> yeah. was number one in the world. Okay, in mogul skiing. Also played at the University of Colorado. First time he touched the ball as a true freshman, ran it back 80 yards for a touchdown. Then he went to the Turin Olympics, decided he was done with mogul skiing, went to the NFL Combine, got drafted fifth round to the Philadelphia Eagles. He was an Abercrombie model. Remember back in the day when like the all the like rip, you know, mm-hmm. Um, started a charity in our hometown granting wishes for senior citizens. If you were wondering uh -huh. if he was a jerk, no. Mm -hmm. um, and then most recently, the kid that we just thought was a really fast runner uh, started and sold a software company. So here's, you know, little, little Jeremy at the table. Jordan is a Harvard-educated cardiothoracic surgeon at Massachusetts General who's literally dedicated his life to saving the lives of kids with congenital heart defects at like Harvard's teaching hospital. Uh -huh. And here I am the family felon. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this cannot be the way the story ends. I need a massive rebrand. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I'll do. I'll write a book and get a movie made. <laughs> what else is there? Freaking genius. Like, I was 35 years old, millions of dollars in debt. Yeah. A convicted felon, a social pariah. What do you do? Mm. What do you do when you don't like the way the story's been told? Mm -hmm. You figure out a way to tell it differently, right? Mm -hmm. From your words. So I got all these awesome meetings at the public with publishers. And they wanted big celebrity takedown pieces. And they were willing to give me pretty big advances that would, that would help a lot of my financial issues. I was living with my mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I said, that's not the story. And I got rejected and rejected and rejected. And finally, I got a little book deal and I published that book and I waited for my life to change and like 10 people bought it. Mm. I think eight of them had my last name. Um, but I still, this was my startup, right? Yeah, yeah. I still believed in it. I just needed to find a different way in. Mm -hmm. And so 
I took a bunch of meetings in Hollywood because I wanted to learn the business. And what I found was that nothing happens unless you get one of these really prolific filmmakers, writers or directors. Even if you attach great talent to it, it still doesn't necessarily go anywhere. Mm -hmm. But if you have Sorkin, if you have Spielberg, if you have Shonda Rhimes, if you have Tyler Perry, it's gonna get, it's gonna go somewhere. Yeah. There were so many people in DC and LA and New York making calls to the studio saying, please don't do the Molly Bloom story. So it also had to be someone who was brave. And I'm a huge Sorkin fan. The West Wing, A Few Good Men, mm -hmm. Moneyball. You can feel the integrity and the courage that he writes with. Mm -hmm. I'm like, he's the one. But Aaron Sorkin is the highest paid screenwriter in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have any social media. <laughs> so, cannot DM. Cannot DM. Um, and so, I, I mean, there's, you know, moats and moats and moats around him. But I just stayed relentless trying to, you know, go down this, the web of how to get to him. And finally, I found this great uh, entertainment attorney who's represents like huge clients but he and i became friends and and he said i can send this book to, to sorkin and then a couple of days later i got a message forwarded from ken to me from aaron that said i'm looking forward to meeting molly for lunch <laughs> i was like what <laughs> um and little did i know like he really wasn't interested he was doing a favor for Ken. Um, and so I flew to LA and I had this moment before I walked in that door, like, what am I doing? What am I thinking? His last movie was about, you know, Facebook. Like, and then I just said to myself, you have to believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, just like when I was 12 years old, like, you have to believe that anything is possible, that why not you? And it's a good story and it's a unique story. So just chin up, girl. And I walked in and told him my story. And when I was done, I guess it worked, the little mind shift, because he said, uh, well, I'll tell you one thing, kid. I have never met someone so down on their luck and so full of themselves. Um, I wasn't full of myself but I encourage people to believe in themselves, mm -hmm. even at rock bottom. Even if you're 35 years old, living with your mother, millions of dollars in debt, and a convicted felon, to believe that you are still worthy of incredible things. In fact, you're more worthy because you have a story, mm -hmm. you know, and you've, and you've been through hell. And so... I said, well, are you in? And it took him a couple of weeks. He told me that he knew he wanted to write the movie before he left the parking lot, but he slow played it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And he, he asked me questions and, and he, he called me, I'll never forget this. He called me, he said, I have good news and bad news. The good news is, is I'm gonna, I'm gonna write the movie. The bad news is, you're going to have zero creative control. Now, there are a couple times <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, zero. Fine. Now, I would have trusted him just like I trusted Jim Walden. There's been a couple people in my life that I have been able to take a step back and say, I totally trust you. But then I had this great idea, like this great thought. So I called him back and I said, but Aaron, I'm your only source material. <laughs> because this had just happened. There was a couple, you know, there's like a vanity fair. There was some articles, but there wasn't enough for him to do what his process yeah, whole story. generally is. Right. And so for eight months while doing community service for the government um, and working at a downtown clothing warehouse 
another part of my day was going to Aaron's office and constructing the story, which was the most incredible experience. I'm sure. That's amazing. Just to see him in his process and and then to see how hard he fought for this movie. I mean, we went to studio heads and they're like, I can't sell a movie about a girl unless she loves someone, has a broken heart. Um, and both Aaron and I said, you know, women deserve to be able to have stories that yeah. don't put them into this box. I love love. I had some boyfriends. That's all, That was a different genre. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to go there in this movie. That's amazing. It got done. It's a pretty, ro it's a rocking movie for sure. Um, you know, your story has a lot of ups and a lot of downs. And I think the, I, I, the really remarkable lesson in my mind is really those, those two paths of the things that were the events were happening and how full circle you came to kind of discover yourself, um, root for yourself, even at rock bottom. It's pretty, it's a pretty powerful thing, but like what's maybe one piece of advice that you would give to somebody facing a huge pivot in their life, you know, based on your journey, what would you say to them? First of all, I would, if there's one thing I could tell anybody, it would be to start a meditation practice. Here's why. It's not just me and other people being anecdotal. There's real hard science behind it. If anyone's curious uh, to look into that, I think Sarah Lazar does some of the most fascinating work. She'll run brain scans on people who have never meditated. And then she'll have them meditate, I think, for 20 minutes a day, eight weeks. And when she reruns the brain scans, she sees uh, a decrease in the, in the gray matter in the amygdala, which is the part of the, it's the lizard brain. Fear, survival... Um, you know, uh, risk averse, et cetera. And she sees an increase in the gray matter in the prefrontal cortex, which is the newer, smarter part of the brain that's responsible for creative thinking. Um, I would not recommend starting at 20 minutes. I would recommend starting at 30 seconds mm. because it is a very hard thing to do if you haven't done it before to sit with your mind. And just to give you a real quick like way to get started, I practice Vipassana because that's the best way I have found to really be able to start to own your focus. And um, so you sit down and you put your attention on the breath in the same way that you'd put your attention on a book you're trying to absorb. Mm -hmm. And you just follow the breath in and out and inevitably the mind will start and you just label it thinking and come back to the breath. And you just do that over and over. And, and first thing in the morning, if you can, and build up slowly so it's not, there's not too much uh, discomfort. And, um, you know, just if you want more guidance, headspace is great. Um, for more advanced meditators, I think... Uh, Sam Harris's waking up app is fascinating. Mm -hmm. But what started to, what starts to happen is you you start to really calm the noise. Mm -hmm. and and so many people don't know that there's a separation between the thoughts and the emotions and reality. And so many times there is. Yeah, that's why you got to become the observer because right. there is that separation. We're just telling ourselves these stories. We're just listening to this. You know, I, I think about it. It's called the default mode network. I think about it as just the running scripts of a survival-based brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, even people-pleasing had its, had its value for, for uh, survival because if you were in the village and you're a mom and you have a bunch of kids, you got to make sure everyone in the village really, really likes you so they're going to bring you food. I mean, there's all, you know, the, the, the sort of, the brain is meant to 
keep you alive, mm-hmm. not necessarily keep you happy, not make you a great entrepreneur, mm-hmm. um, not make you a great partner. And that's why I think doing something like meditation in which you are starting to investigate the contents of your mind and learn how to manage them is absolutely the first place I would start. I love it. And then second, effective presence. Learn um, learn about how people make decisions. It's mostly based on emotions. And so you may have a meeting with someone and have said something that they didn't like. And the brain will store that as a memory in your subconscious. And so when you see them, you're not really sure why, but you don't want to, you don't want to go talk to them or you don't want to work with them or you don't want to do a deal with them. And so I kind of think when you meet someone, you have this shock. Because when you meet someone, you're not just meeting them, right? Mm -hmm. You're meeting their ex-wife or their ex-husband or their ex-boss or, you know, all these people, this cult of unworthiness, these people that have made them feel like they need to armor up. Mm -hmm. And when someone's armored up, you're not going to have it. You're not going to be able to establish a genuine connection with them. Absolutely. And so it's your job in the first couple minutes through eye contact, through warmth, through authenticity, through deep listening and, um, you know, several other factors uh, to show them that you're with them. Mm -hmm. You don't agree with that whole consortium behind Mm -hmm. their head, you know? Yeah. Because it's only when both people can drop their ego and both people can drop their armor that, that you can start to have real impact and, 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 cultivate real relationships. And that's the name of the game. Well said. Well said. Well, we're not done yet. Okay. We have some rapid fire questions. It's your turn to talk. <laughs> no, 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 no. Definitely not my turn. <laughs> not my turn. We just want to know more about you. So I I um I want to ask you a few questions. This one's this is one that I think is this is such a Chris Allen question, by the way. That puts a number on something that is not a number. But um, the first one is on a scale of one to 10, how accurate was the movie? 10 being perfectly accurate. Eight and a half. Eight and a half. Yep. I love it. Well, if you could ski anywhere in the world today, where would you go? I'd go heli skiing. Okay. Well, what's the weirdest habit or quirk that you're most proud of? God, there's so many. Um... I don't know because I feel like my whole life is weird and quirky. Okay, here's one. Okay. It's not a habit or a quirk. It's a, um, it's a aberrant way to do things that really works and I'm proud of how we've done it. So I met my ex. Um, we got married which is something I never thought I would do. Um, And then we had, I got pregnant. And two months into my pregnancy, I'm like, this marriage is like, this this isn't going to work. And I knew that I wanted to have it figured out before Fiona came into the world. So Devin was finishing a PhD. I left him, our life, two months pregnant. And then we, you know, we, we, we did what we needed to do. We grieved or whatever. And he was there for a year and a half. And now he lives with us and we're best friends. And we love this little girl. Wow. And like, I mean, even the other night, I'm like, mom and dad are going out. You know, we have a relationship. Yeah, yeah. But it's like... It's all, it's like beautiful. It's, it's. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's a little quirky, but. A little quirky, but. Especially when I talk to other people that I potentially might date. I'm like, well, my 
ex lives in my basement, so. <laughs> it's really the Airbnb, but. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, that was unexpected, by the way, that quirk. That was unexpected. Well, I, I, like to, <laughs> I, I like to surprise you guys. <laughs> I love it. Well, if you could instantly become an expert in anything, what would it be? AI. Okay. I love that. Well, who's the most generous tipper that you can share uh, that you've ever encountered in a poker game? Celebrity or someone that you don't know? <laughs> you can say the name. Yeah, whoever it is. Um, it's, it was this guy, Larry. Larry the Tipper. I love it. Uh, okay, so did you pick Jessica Chastain? Uh, and if you didn't, who is your alternative that you would have picked to play you in a movie? Um, well, it was mind-blowing because as soon as Aaron took on the project, like a bevy of A-list actresses were like writing him, begging him for the part because um, he had never written a movie with a female lead. And when I saw Jessica's name in contention, I was like, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I was like, because I fell in love with her in Zero Dark Thirty. She yeah. was so fierce. And that was the only, that was the first movie that I had seen that wasn't like a documentary mm -hmm. where a woman was given the opportunity to just be on a, on, on a hunt for, you know, yeah, and didn't fall in love with her superior or whatever, you know? And so, and I just thought she was so versatile in the help and, and interstellar. And I mean, she, I really was crossing my fingers that it would be her. Um, and I definitely subtly let that be known. Be known. But, but. You with your zero creative control. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I also knew that Aaron was the expert here. Yeah. When I find a true expert, I set my dilettante ass down. <laughs> <laughs> there are things that I am uh, for sure going to, you know, advocate for myself for, but he's, you know, he yeah. knows what he's doing. He's the bee's knees. Mm -hmm. But what's the largest amount of money uh, that you saw someone lose in one night? $100 million. And uh, what's next for Molly Bloom? Um, so... I'm trying to understand and formulate strategy around a two-year-old. Mm. Been there. Okay. I'll, I'd love some advice. Um, I'm writing a book on effective presence. I mean, I, I actually haven't actually heard anybody talk about that, but I'm like, it makes total sense. I think it's a really, um, uh, it's a really great thing to kind of unpack for people because it's something that we all kind of like, it makes a lot of sense when you talk about it, but I don't think there's a lot of understanding about no, it. No, there's not. And the only other thing is EQ and Dan Goldman. I mean, that's prolific research, but a lot of it relies on reading people. Mm -hmm. And I'm really good at reading people. So were a lot of people at the table and their error variance is too high. To me, it makes so much more sense to know how the brain works, to know how people work, and then to you know, figure out the things that increase the probability versus the things that decrease the probability. It's really, it's just, it's a learnable skill. Oh, it's really awesome. Well, I have to say, um, it was truly an honor to sit down and have a conversation with you about your story and unpack it in the level of detail that we did. So thank you for coming to the Entrepreneur Studio. Well, thank you for inviting me and you're an excellent journalist. Okay. Just a marketing guy trying to figure it all out. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Appreciate it.